Welcome to Let the Qur'an Speak. Hadith are sayings of the Prophet. We refer to these on a regular basis on our show. But let me ask you this. How do you know it's actually from the Prophet, exactly how he said it? Is it possible that the message was lost in translation? Well, it turns out there's an entire methodology to understand and validate Hadith. To help us explore exactly how this works, let's sit down with Dr. Shabir Ali to discuss the book, Hanafi Principles of Testing Hadith. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shabir. Pleasure to be on. So today we're doing a book review, um, and I know the book that we're reviewing is, uh, is focused on hadith. Now, is this a topic that uh, scholars generally study? Because I don't think I've ever, I don't think we've done a book review on hadith, to be honest. Mm, um, th there are um, several books actually written on the subject of um, what is called hadith criticism in, in modern English, but uh, the classical Arabic scholars would have referred to us, uh, it as naqtul hadith, uh, which means the same thing, uh, hadith uh, criticism. And uh, I, I, this might sound strange to the modern Muslim ear, um, like yeah, we're criticizing the words of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the answer to that is no. Uh, what is meant by hadith criticism is the whole process of uh, deciding which are the words of the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, and which are not his words. So or this is where things like, oh, this hadith is authentic, not so authentic, sort of, th this is where that conversation comes from? I exactly, yeah, it's, it's through that process that scholars will decide. It's not in the, like in the case of the Quran, which is transmitted to us um, by such large numbers of people from one generation to another that nobody has any doubt as to what's the Quran and what is not. Uh, whereas in the case of Hadith, uh, sc Muslim scholars had to go through rigorous uh, methods uh, to try and separate the wheat from the shaif because people started to uh, invent things and claim that the Prophet peace be upon him said this or did this uh, and that becomes precedent in Islamic law so to prove something people would invent things about the Prophet peace be upon him so the Muslim scholars had to draw that distinction and that process is referred to as hadith criticism. So I know the, the so the book that you reviewed it yes. uh, the title is focused on a Hanafi school of thought so does that mean that there are other um, schools of thought and different methods of uh, hadith uh, criticism and interpretation? Yeah, this particular book is referred to, uh, the, the title is Hanafi Principles of Testing Hadith or Usul al-Hanafi al naqd al-Hadith in Arabic. It is basically an, an, an Arabic book at the core, uh, but it's been translated and uh, further expanded uh, with the help of the author's uh, student, Sulaiman Ahmed. Let me first say that the author's name is uh, Sheikh Atabek uh, Shukurov uh, and Nasafi. He hails from Uzbekistan, but now lives in the United Kingdom, um, where he and his student uh, have uh, authored this book and uh, published it through their academy, Av Avicenna Academy. Now, uh, yes, there there are uh, other schools of um, uh, or other m methods or principles by which scholars have evaluated. Now, uh, what is the Hanafi school? Then let me let me just mm -hmm. say something about that. Uh, Hanafi is one of the four major schools of Islamic jurisprudence, and is widely followed uh, throughout the world today. Um, in India and Pakistan, for example, the Hanafi school is mainly followed. My four parents came from um, India and um, migrated to Guyana, and in Guyana, uh, the Hanafi school was widely practiced in, in, in the days of my childhood. Now things have changed and more influences have uh, arrived and many people have shifted away from the Hanafi uh, principles and method, but it is all is still widely followed. Uh, in the world as well, uh, the uh, Mali school and the Shafi school are widely followed and recently the Hanbali school became uh, widely known among academics uh, and non-Muslims more generally because that is the school that is followed in Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, that school is closely um, affiliated with uh, the modern Salafi uh, movement which also becomes uh, a, a matter for modern study. Now, the main uh, uh, focus of this of this book is the, is the Hanafi uh, school. Yep. In fact, it is the the only focus. What, what is the Hanafi? Um, uh, what are the Hanafi principles in the, uh, criticizing Hadith? And uh, your question then is, how is that different from the other from schools? The other schools yeah. and, and the the other schools mainly uh, have. Uh, a thought of hadith as being much more reliable and, and they have tended to base their 
uh, Islamic positions more squarely on hadith than the Hanafi school has tended to. And, and that has to do with the, the general attitude towards uh, hadith, whereas in the Hanafi school, which was uh, the earliest of the four, uh, it, the, uh, it, it, at that time, the, the knowledge about hadith was such that it is known that hadith is being transmitted from uh, one person to another, mainly by word of mouth, and uh, a lot of errors can creep into the hadith. In the later times, uh, the, the schools uh, saw that uh, hadith is being narrated in a systematic manner, and uh, they had more confidence in hadith, and so Imam Shafi, um, he had a great influence in this, in, in give, uh, giving people the sense that hadith uh, is reliable, and that uh, it should, the, the hadith should be largely followed. Uh, his students, or people following from the schools uh, within that school of thinking of Imam Shafi, then compiled uh, the major books of hadith that we have today. So Bukhari, Muslim, uh, Bukhari was a student of Imam, uh, uh, well, he's a follower of that same line of thinking, uh, the Shafi school of, uh, of approach towards uh, uh, hadith criticism. So this does, I mean, it does to the average person like me, it does sound like a complicated topic. Is the book an easy read for, you know, someone who's not a scholar? Um? Yes, in fact, it is quite simple to read and uh, where uh, it becomes quite interesting for the, the average, uh, for our viewers and for the average Muslim, is where those uh, principles, once uh, done with theoretically, uh, are shown to apply to uh, matters which come up in everyday questions among Muslims or which non-Muslims may be asking uh, Muslims to deal with. Uh, take for example the question of apostasy. Uh, this is dealt with towards the end of the book by the uh, uh, student uh, Sulaiman Ahmed and, and he shows that the hadith which uh, is normally relied on by those who think that the apostate should be put to death is not reliable. On the other hand, given that's the a Hanifi, conclusion that they draw. That's one this. of the conclusions, mm -hmm. yes, because one of the Hanafi principles is that if something is clear from the Quran, it will not be contradicted by uh, by a hadith, uh, and and this requires some further explanation. Uh, one of the principles of the Hanafi school is that uh, there a distinction is made between the hadith mutawatir and hadith ahad. Uh, and this distinction actually is made in all of the other schools, but how to treat the hadith ahad, this is what needs to be uh, and further what does that clarified. Mean? So hadith mutawatir is that which is transmitted so widely uh, that there is no doubt that this actually came from the Prophet, peace be upon him. But those hadiths are very few. Uh, in fact, uh, some 200 or so hadiths, uh, according to this book, uh, fall under that category, whereas we have like thousands just of Just 200. Just about 200. Mm -hmm. And we say about because it requires some uh, uh, judgment from uh, the various scholars, and some will judge one hadith to be mutawatir, another will judge it to not be mutawatir. So around 200 is a, is a fair number. Some say even 400, but that's not the view taken by this book. And even so, uh, <coughs> those are hadiths uh, which are so widespread uh, in terms of its overall content, but not necessarily in the precise wording. In fact, according to this book, there is only one hadith which the scholars have uh, unanimously agreed on uh, to be mutawatir in its very wording. Uh, and that is the hadith that says that if anyone attributes to the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, something that he didn't say, then they may as well take their seat in hell. Um, so th there are other hadiths which uh, are mutawatir in meaning, for example, the hadiths which uh, give us the number of uh, cycles in our daily prayers, for example. Um, so uh, these are related by large numbers of people, so the information is dependable, uh, but the, the, the information is not related word for word verbatim, just the overall meaning mm -hmm. and, and the, the idea. The idea is the same. Now, when it c the rest of the hadith can basically be referred to as ahad, although the Hanafis distinguish between what is called uh, mashhur, meaning famous, and ahad, meaning that they do not fit any one of the other categories. Neither neither uh, uh, so multiply attested to be called mutawatir, nor so famous as to be called mashhur, mm -hmm. uh, but they might be related by one or two individuals in a generation. And typically what has happened with hadith is that uh, you might have like in the first uh, uh, two generations, only one person relating to another person, and then it spreads out to many people. 
Now, I, you may have seen one of those shampoo commercials that says that if this girl tells two of her friends and then Pass all each the message, one yeah. tells two friends, <laughs> yeah. then you see how widespread it quickly becomes, right? Yeah. Uh, in the case of hadiths, it didn't become widespread so quickly. It, it becomes widespread like in the third generation and so on. Um, so you might have a hadith starting out with one person who then has some students, or one person who, ha who tells only one person who then has some students, and then it starts to spread out. So when we're dealing with one person telling one person, there is a possibility of error. Now, in the Hanafi school, this is taken very seriously. And uh, one, uh, seeing that there is that possibility of error, if the hadith is contrary to something that is clear from the Quran, uh, the Hanafis would not give credence to that hadith. They would rather go with the Quran, which is uh, itself a very dependable as the Word of God. So when the Quran so very clearly, time and again, speaks about apostasy and never prescribes the death penalty for the apostate, on the contrary, uh, saying leave the apostates alone, God will deal with them in the life hereafter, then it would be a travesty in the Hanafi school to then uh, apply okay, this penalty yeah. for apostasy to them. This will be going against the Quran. Uh, another case in point is the case about uh, the female uh, head, uh, face covering, uh, what is referred to as niqab in Arabic. Uh, now, given the Hanafi principles, uh, when the hadith, um, uh, which seems to imply that the woman's face should be covered, uh, is looked at carefully, uh, we see that uh, this uh, it, it does not stand up to the Hanafi scrutiny. One of the principles described in the book is what is referred to as umum al balwa. Uh, that's an Arabic term uh, referring to the case where uh, a hadith speaks about something that will affect people at large. And yet, only one person seems to narrate this information. Now, think about the situation in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Suppose the Prophet is teaching something which is so important in Islam, then everybody has to know it, right? Especially if it affects everybody. Yeah. Uh, and this, was, of course, will affect women in general. So all women have to know, do they have to cover their faces or not? And uh, it is also the obligation of that first generation of Muslims to trans uh, transmit the information about what is truly Islam to the next generation. So uh, it affects everybody, everybody knows about it, it is their obligation to transmit it to the next generation, so everybody will be telling everybody that this is what has to be done, right? And yet we, the hadith that people rely on to say that the woman should cover her face, this it, it is only related by one person. So the, the Hanafis take this to be non, not reliable. It's more likely that this is the invention of somebody and, and it is not uh, really uh, what is prescribed in, in Islam. Is there anywhere, I mean, from the way you're talking, it sounds like it's a very comprehensive book. Is there anywhere um, where you find that the book is lacking um, uh, content or clarity in a particular area? Um, um, I think the book needs to be edited a little bit better, um, uh, perhaps because it is published in-house uh, and not done through um, a usual publisher that will, who will have their professional editors. Uh, so some, sometimes there is a spelling uh, or a typo. Um, uh, the uh, paragraphs are not uh, indented uh, in, in the first uh, line, um, and, and, and that uh, jars the, the, mm -hmm, the, yeah. the reader because you want to see at a glance where the next paragraph begins. And it is clear enough, but still, that could have been made clearer by fo following the usual convention, and uh, that's probably just a stylistic issue. They, they, you know, whoever uh, styled the, the paragraph text uh, um, did, did not um, ask for the indentation of the first uh, line. Uh, but uh, there are issues like that. Other than that, I find it to be a very comprehensive book, and it is the first uh, dealing with this subject from the Hanafi school. And it is an important book, because as explained in this book, what has happened over time is that these Hanafi principles of uh, criticizing hadith have actually largely been forgotten. Uh, even the Hanafis themselves nowadays, uh, they are studying in Hanafi institutions, but they're learning the Shafi method. Actually, the Shafi method has taken over, and that has led to an over-reliance on, on hadith uh, among Muslims in general. Uh, those who are following that Shafi method, uh, uh, that is seen in the modern Salafi movement as well. And uh, it, even the Hanafis have become affected by that. They're going to Hanafi institutions, but they're studying the they're Shafi uh, mm -hmm. method, and they're studying the Shafi books of hadith, and this actually creates a kind of uh, um, cognitive dissonance because uh, the, the Hanafi 
uh, school gives you certain rulings which are based on the Hanafi method of applying hadith. Uh, and uh, well, it seems like you're losing a critical area, right? Uh, that's yeah. right, and that's right. And then the the Hanafi scholars now are studying the Hashafi method, and they're seeing that there's a disconnect between uh, the method and the results because the results is that they are practicing a Hanafi uh, uh, practice uh, and legal legal maxims, uh, whereas the hadith that they're dealing with are coming through the Shafi school and tested and and graded to be authentic in order to the Shafi school. So the result is that they may have a hadith which they think is authentic and is contrary to a practice which is in the Hanafi school which they think to be also authentic. So there's It's like this what do you do? Yeah. Yes. But this book gives clarity to such uh, problems and uh, it, it is high time that this uh, book has been published and uh, it is necessary uh, for all Hanafis to uh, read this book but also others as well to learn uh, something from these Hanafi principles and maybe to apply them I even across the board, even in other schools. A very engaging discussion as usual. Thank you, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome. Hey, YouTube. We hope you benefited from this video. If you liked it, or if you didn't, let us know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more, check out some of our other videos. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.